is one of the ones that I memorized. I, I remember back when I was still a uh, college professor, we'd be at graduation waiting until all the kids walked across the stage. And I was sitting there at the time just memorizing scripture because it would just take forever. Take forever. Take forever. And um, um, it goes like this. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast unto the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor woman cried out and the Lord heard her and saved her out of all her troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around all of those, around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Many, 19, many of, are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them, him out of them all. I'll say, this is all King James, that's why I've got hymns. He guards all his bones, not one of them is both broken, even shall the slay, even shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Amen. Amen. Psalm is a wisdom psalm. Uh, psalm. What you say? The psalm, psalms are known as the uh, hymn book of Israel. The hymn book of Israel. And I've always liked the Psalms, but uh, when I went to Israel a couple years ago, I really started to appreciate them. I remember, and I may have mentioned this before, the first time we, we had driven around, you know, we'd gone all over Israel and parts of Palestine, and they held Jerusalem till the very end. And Jerusalem is higher in elevation than the surrounding area. And so as we were about to ascend into Israel, I mean, not Israel, Jerusalem. Uh, the tour guide told us, he said, there is a song that the pilgrims say typically as they are about to ascend into Jerusalem. I shall lift up my eyes into the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. And I'm like, wow. And so we went up to the top and we looked over and we saw, first thing we saw, that big gold dome of the rock. You know, dome, what well, wasn't first thing, first was a little highway, but the dome of the, I think it's dome of the rock. And I was like, oh my God, we're really here. You know, it was, it was phenomenal. I mean, it was unbelievable. I said, all these years we've talked about, of course, you know, we're not going to talk about how I almost drowned in the Dead Sea, but that's not the story for another sermon. But, <laughs> which really virtually is impossible because of the salt and the buoyancy that you have because it makes your legs kick up. So you can't really drown there. But, um, it was, I lift up my eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. And you know, they say that the thing that about Jerusalem, I'll let you guys in on this, uh, the thing about Jerusalem is that you have Judaism, and you have Islam, and you have Christianity. And then when I got over there, I realized not only that, there was also a center for the Baha'is over there, if you know that faith. And uh, I was talking to my seminary professor. We were on a mission trip in uh, Kenya. And he was talking about the concept of thin places. Thin places. It's something you see in Celtic spirituality. And in thin places, there is an understanding or a belief that there are places in the world where the interface between the spiritual and the physical is so thin that the presence of God is almost tangible. And they said, that is the deal. That's the reason why these world religions all want to own Jerusalem. Because it's a thin place. You see, remember the Temple of the Rock was built on the place where Abraham was going to sacrifice his, his son, if you remember that story, Janice. And uh, the reason why he didn't sacrifice his son, he was going to be obedient to God. But then there was a Thank you. There was a ram in the bush because the boy even asked his father, you know, who are we gonna, what are we going to sacrifice? And uh, that ram showed up, 
also a song. But anyway, so these these interface this interface with God. And I'm a, I've talked to friends of mine who've gone to Israel. I've got one friend. She's actually a regional minister, and she's been to uh, Israel five times. She says you you don't go to Israel. You're called to Israel. And she says whenever she goes over there, she has these deeply spiritual experiences. She said. She feels like she's being a little bit more of her, or whatever. She's went through a very traumatic childhood and some other things. She said a little bit more was being healed, a little bit more, a little bit more. You see, in this presence, in this place. We even went so far, and I mean, it was hot, let me tell you. We were climbing these huge stones. I think each stone was maybe about like this, you know, and like that. Ancient stones. We're climbing them to get up into the temple, the temple area, what, what remains of one of the walls. It was beautiful to be there where it all began. But as I have said and said again, the thing that really was attracted me or what really impressed me about being in Jerusalem or Israel wasn't being in Cana, you know, where Jesus did his first miracle and turned water to wine, and outside you can buy all this wine. That didn't impress me. Um, it was all these Christians, all these different flavors of Christians. And there were the Greek Orthodox, even Orthodox, Rus Russian Orthodox from the Eastern Church. There were what, Christians from the Western Church. There were Christians from Africa, Asia. There were Christians. I was even singing with some Christians from Asia. We knew the same hymns. All over the planet because the apostles had did what Jesus had asked them to do. Go, therefore, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded unto you, and lo, I will be with you even until the ends of the earth. I mean, all these are, and you know, I'll be honest with you, some of those clergies, I should have took pictures, because they had on some pretty sharp outfits, you know what I mean? I'm like, all I got was a roll, this one man came through, he had a big crown and a red belt, but also there was a piece of it where there was fanaticism, because we went into the church, let's see, I can't even remember the name of it right now, but it was one of the churches that, um, I think they, I can't remember. Anyway, and they said that if you touch this particular part of the church, that you would be blessed. And I mean, people were going nuts. And I mean, the place was packed. But you see, me, me, and me, I knew, or at least what I believe is, is that the true ministry or the miracle is not in what you can touch to administer is what's in here, in your heart. And what have you opened to the Lord? What have you given him so that he can put more of himself inside you? You know, I talk about, I was talking about this with somebody, I can't remember. It might have been Virgil and he went to sleep on me, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I was, I remember when I, I was at a Joyce Meyer conference and she was doing a baptism of the Holy Spirit and I said, I want everything the Holy Spirit has for me. And sure enough, the Spirit fell on me. Everything changed. Everything changed. There was a new boldness, a new power, a new understanding. It was like my prayers were going up and they're being answered again just right away. I'm like, wow, Lord, if it was like this, why didn't you tell me before? Maybe because I had not made myself open to him. Maybe because I didn't want that much of him. Maybe because it was kind of like, and I'm sure you've heard this analogy before, there was a house. And I would only let the Lord in the living room. I wouldn't let him go all the way back in the back to see the junk room and junk drawers and all that. I would only give so much of him, myself to him, Therefore, he would only give so much of himself to me. 
So in these psalms, this is a wisdom psalm, a psalm of praise. This is powerful. Because David is writing this. David's writing this after he escaped yet another opportunity to be killed. And the way that he got out of the Philistines out of town was he pretended to be insane. So the crazy man gets out of Psalms, I mean, gets out of the city of God, the king of God. But when he gets out, first thing he does is he praises God for what God took him out of. He says his praise shall continually be in his mouth. What is continually in your mouth? Criticism of someone else? James talks about that tongue and how that tongue needs to be reined in like a horse. What is in your mouth? Are you saying negative things about yourself, negative things about other people? Are you doubting? Or, you know, James also talks about double minded ways. Man is unstable in all his ways. What is in your mouth? I used to be a person, you know, that would say negative things about myself. I, I had to, I had to be get out of that. Because you know what? The world is saying enough negative stuff about you. And as for your children, I'm sure people like Anita and Esther, you know, you have kids that just come in already broke down because their parents have just beat them down with their tongues. Words do what it sticks and stones, break my bones, words don't hurt. Oh, words do hurt. And words stick with you. And you can try and try and try. And sometimes you have to pray and ask the Lord, take this off me. Because you remember those words. Even when you don't want to. Even when they're lies. Those words are still creating, creating wounds. I sought the Lord and he heard me. The Lord heard me. He heard me. They looked to him and were radiant, radiant like Moses was when he came down off Sinai. When you have spent time with the Lord, your countenance really does change. People sometimes used to tell me, I don't know anymore, you know, since, you know, Mom Church won't celebrate my birthday, but uh, <laughs> people used to tell me that, especially if I had been a major prayer, because I used to go into church by myself and just lay down on the floor and just be with God. And then I would come out of there and somebody said, look, I can see the Spirit of the Lord all over you. I'm like, wonder what they see. Look in the mirror. You know, is this Mac made up? You know, what are they see? And uh, but when you spend time with the Lord, I believe your countenance really does change. Because everything about you changes because God is able to do something in you. And I tell you, every I believe mm -hmm. that your countenance changes. Because people need what you have. They need to know that he's real. The other night when I was at the opera, there was a couple, and they just came up to me. And uh, Virgil knew it was his cue to leave, because he knew I was going to be there talking for another hour. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they came, and they wanted to talk about things of the Lord, Karen. And I don't know the couple from anybody. And they just kept going on and on and on, and I'm busy telling them, blah, 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 blah. And they told me, they said, well, we might come to your church on Sunday. Side. And I kind of like, okay, Lord, I remember a time I never would have been tied up in anything like that. I would have just said, okay, these are crazy people, let me get out of my way. <laughs> but the Lord knows where He sends people. He sends these, I'm not going to call them baby Christians, but maybe I am. He sends them to places where they can grow. That's the reason why, if we really want our church to be as healthy as possible, we need to be careful about what comes out of our mouths. Whether we are praising the Lord continually, or are we putting each other down? Are we coming down? Because remember, David, David says, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. There is so much power when Christians come together and praise the Lord. I call it spiritual synergy. It gets back to Matthew, where two or three are gathered in my name. I'm there in the midst. There is spiritual synergy. There's something about Christians coming together to praise the Lord, to take the roof off the place. Because we bring different perspectives and we bring different levels of love into that situation. That's the reason why we cannot afford to be inclusive. That it's only people who think like us, or look like us, or act us or have the same amount of money we do. This is not a members only. This is not a country club. The 
is a club for life and living. This is a club for healing and help. That's what we're supposed to be about. They magnified the Lord with me. And then David goes on to say that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fears him and delivers them. Wow. Lord, encamp your angels around us and deliver us. And then he goes on to say, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Wow. This sort of sums up the entire Old Testament mission. Other tribes, other people following other gods and all this other stuff, you know, I mean, come on over here and taste and see that the Lord is good. You may not know how it happens or what happens. Or, you know, a lot of times I Oh, well, you know, we didn't see a change. Well, you don't know what's happening. I remember once I was talking to a youth group, and I said, uh, coming to Jesus is not about coming down here in front of me or someone else at the altar. I said, if you get up in the middle of the night and you feel the urge, say, Lord, save me. Jesus Christ. I remember hearing the story of, uh, oh man, my mind's gone today. I guess that comes with age. Um, <laughs> Barbara Taylor, can't think of her last name right now. She's a very famous Episcopal minister, well written. I uh, mean, very number of books out there. Brown, Barbara Taylor Brown, Episcopal priest. And I remember hearing about her story of conversion. She ended up, you know, I'm going to end on this. She, um, she was a student in college. And one night, a group of, uh, I think it was Crusaders for Christ or Campus for Christ, they came by our room, the dorm room. And so they were praying. They, you know, were in there talking to them. So she got to thinking that, hey, you know, I'll just tell them anything just to get out of here. Get them out of here. And she told them, and they, prayed the sinner's prayer and prayed that she would receive Christ and you know she agreed that she would receive Christ and they left she went to bed the next morning she woke up everything had changed everything had changed physical priest powerful woman of God well I don't know how many books she's written Everything had changed. Don't underestimate the power of the Spirit. I sought the Lord and I heard Him. And He delivered me out of my fear, all of my fears. They looked to Him and were radiant. Their faces were not afraid. This poor woman cried out, and the Lord heard her and saved her out of her troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped around those who delivers them. Deliver, uh, those who fear him and delivers him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in him. Let us stand. At this time